Hello, alô, alô. Alô? Ok. Bom, então, para começar agora a sessão do Momentos Telefônica, meu nome é Pablo Lorenzoni, eu sou coordenador da área de software livre, que é aquela área azulzinha que fica ali no meio. Uh, eu quero apresentar para vocês, então, um dos grandes colaboradores e amigos da comunidade de software livre no Brasil, que é o John Mad Dog Hall, também meu amigo pessoal. E ele vai fazer uma palestra hoje sobre criar empregos de computação de forma sustentável. Uma palestra que vocês vão, vão gostar, tenho certeza. John. Thank you. Thank you. Today I'm going to be talking about a project that I have been working on for five years in doing the planning. It's called Project Kawa, and it's about creating sustainable computing jobs. A lot of you know me as this nice old man with a long white beard who talks about free software. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> But in reality, I have been in the computing industry for 42 years. And I've been doing Unix for 20 years of that, and Linux since 1994 when I met Linus Torvalds. I have had a wide variety of jobs, almost every type of job in the computing industry. And I've worked on extremely large systems and extremely small systems. Most importantly, I've been both a vendor of computing systems, trying to get computers out to people, and I've been a user of computing systems, trying to wait for the bug patches and the fixes and the information from the vendor so I could do my work. And I helped to build the foundation of systems that Tim Berners-Lee built the World Wide Web upon. That was me and this is you. You are basically a good person. You like other people. You want to do good in the world. That's one of the reasons why you came here to Campus Party. But you're a bit of a geek. You know, sometimes you're concentrated so much on the technology that you ignore other things, like taking a shower. <laughs> okay, you're really geeky, all right? But that's okay, because what a geek is, is a person who has intense interest in a subject. You're very technical. But what you don't necessarily know is how to take that technology and set up a business to make money. And as I come to the campus parties here in Brazil and the free software places in Brazil, they always say to me, Mad Dog, how can I make money with free software? So you want to have a job a job that works with free software. Perhaps a job that would start paying you 2,000 reais a month and could actually build up to 4,000 reais a month as a base salary. And if you worked at additional things like programming web or writing programs for some of your customers, you could actually make an additional 4,000 reais a month for a total of 8,000 reais a month. It's a job where you would be your own boss. You would set your own hours. You could decide when you wanted to take vacation or not. And it's a job that you could typically work from, from your own house or your own apartment. Maybe you are a single parent and you need to stay home with your children. Maybe you're physically challenged and it's difficult for you to leave your house. You could do this job from inside of your house. How many of you would like that job? I thought so, because I want you to be a Kawa entrepreneur. Look, it's the same person. It's just that they put on a tie. You will know how to set up your own business, and you will create and lead a local community around free software. You're going to own that business, and you're going to manage your time, 
and you're going to create your own future. And yes, you'll still be a geek. We can't take that out of you. Now, how many of you know about the One Laptop Per Child program? It's a wonderful program, giving a laptop to every child so that they can learn about computers. And you give a laptop to a child who's seven years old, and 10 years later, they may go out into the industry and pay back society for that laptop. And typically, these are thought of for places like Africa and, you know, places far from the city. When most of the people in the United States think of Latin America, they think of the Brazilian rainforest. They think of football, but they call it soccer. They think of piranha. And then every once in a while, they think of carnival. <laughs> but what they don't think about is they don't think about that Sao Paulo is the second largest city on the face of the earth with between 19 and 29 million people, depending upon how you count them. And they don't think about the fact that 80%, pardon me while I get rid of this, 80% of the people in South America live in an urban environment. They live in cities with tall skyscrapers and tall apartment houses and tall office buildings. They don't think about that. And they don't think about the fact that you live in a very dense environment. People are living very close together in these urban cities. And they don't think about the fact that the internet is not 500 miles away from the people that don't have it. It's typically only 50 feet away. And if we can bridge that 50 feet, then we can bring the internet to everybody. And we can bring training and education to everybody. And I'm gonna show you how to do that with Project Kawa. Because I care about the millions of God's children living in these places. Oops. Okay. For some reason, oh, there we go. So here is the goals of Project Kawa. I want to create millions of new private sector high-tech jobs in Latin America, and many more millions around the world. Now, Project Kawa it will not work every place. It will not work in Oklahoma in the United States. It will not work in Kansas because the people live too far apart. I want to make computers easier to use. Computers today are difficult to use. We think they're easy because we're geeks. We love to have pain. We love to struggle with the computer, but most people don't. I want to make computing more environmentally friendly. I want to decrease the cellular and wireless contention. Here in Campus Party, it's hard to have everybody using wireless because we don't have enough spectrum to allow you to have the bandwidth which you need. I can fix that. And I want to create a gratis, that means free as in free beer, a gratis wireless network over all the urban areas in Latin America. And finally, I want to create for you either low cost or gratis supercomputing so that your industries can do the computing they need to bring Latin America into the 22nd century. And all of this done in a sustainable way with little or no money coming from the government. As a matter of fact, I will create money in taxes for the government. So let's take the first uh, thing, creating millions of new jobs. How do I do that? First of all, 
I'm going to enable systems administrators like you, people who know how to set up systems and make them work, to start your own business. I'm going to create business plans that you can take to a bank and borrow the money to start your own business. I'm going to create the marketing materials for you so that you can go out and find customers to buy your services. And I'm going to create the training and the certification and work with the government to license you so that you will provide these services directly to the customers. As a systems administrator and entrepreneur, you're going to go out and find these customers. And then you're going to take their information to a local bank and you're going to get the money to buy the equipment, to put it in place, and to start selling the services. Now, as a systems administrator and entrepreneur, you need two types of training. The technical training, most of you already have. Some of you may need a little bit more. That's okay, we'll supply it. But you also need business training. How to look at how the money flows through your business to make sure you have enough money to get your business going until you can start getting the money from your customers. We'll create many different types of training, both online, which will be free, classroom, which will have to ch charge for the person's time in the classroom, and an apprenticeship program for you to work with other entrepreneurs to learn. And then you can get certified, licensed, and insured. What we're going to do is in the basement of all of those tall buildings, whether it be a tall office building or a tall apartment house, we're going to put a highly available server we're going to put a system that when one part of it fails, the other part takes over automatically. That's going to be the server system, and that's where most of your computing is going to be done. Then we're going to connect those server systems to thin clients on everybody's desk or in everybody's apartment. And that's going to be connected through a very high-speed wired network which is also going to supply the power to those thin clients. So those thin clients will not have to be plugged in to your apartment. We are also going to make those thin clients as a wireless mesh repeater. So it's going to create a wireless bubble throughout your apartment and throughout your building and probably even out onto the street outside of your building. And we'll see how that works later. All of this, of course, is going to be supporting free software, the Linux operating system. However, we will also give certain amounts of services to Windows and Apple systems. We'll see more about that later. I'd like to introduce you to two people, my mother and father. My father is 89, and my mother is, well, we won't say how old she is. She wouldn't like it. They can actually use a computer. They can send email. They can surf the web. But the problem is, my father thinks that a backup is what you do with a car to put it into a parking place. And my mother thinks that a virus is something you feed chicken soup to. Neither one of them know how to install software. Neither one of them know how to take a computer apart and put it together again. These are the things that a systems administrator could do for them if they could afford to have a systems administrator. Let's take a look at something. There are 1.25 billion desktop computers in the world. If each one of those 1.25 billion desktop computers cause their user to waste only 15 minutes a day. Let's say that's about five reais a day. That means that we're losing 6.25 billion reais 
every day because the computer software doesn't work the way we think it should. If we could cut that down, we could save a lot of money. 6.25 billion reais is about how much the United States spends on the Iraq war every day. Just think, we could start another war. Wonderful. Or we could maybe give medicine to every child that needs it. Looking at it another way, if you have a company with 300 people that use computers, because the software doesn't work the way you think it should, it's like nine of those people never showed up to work. As a manager, you would be furious about this, but yet you never see it because it's lost 15 minutes a day. And this doesn't even count into fact the frustration factor that I don't want to use my computer because it's so difficult. If computers were easy to use, then people would want to use them. And you become more efficient. So the system administrator entrepreneur's main job duties are to monitor the usage of the server system and to make sure that they're working properly, to monitor the thin clients, to make sure they're working, to give it of spam and viruses, and then to teach classes to the end users to help them use their computers better, to show them how to use new pieces of software so that they can do what they want to do easier and faster. And for this, the users will pay you a certain amount of money every month, and this will be your salary. They will also pay you money to rent their thin clients and the part of the servers that they use. We think about, in computer science, we think about markets as being either horizontal or vertical. Horizontal markets are things like operating systems, compilers, things that everybody uses. Vertical markets are like retail, hospitals, restaurants, hotels, those types of markets. We have found several different markets that we could put Kawa software into. One of them is home automation. 50 years ago, I would read magazines about how someday my house would turn on its lights and turn them off and my house would take care of me and it still hasn't happened. With Project Kawa, we could automate this. We could make it so that when you left your house, the temperature would turn down, saving you some money. When you left the house, all of the lights would go off. We could provide a security system and other things for home automation. We could replace many smaller systems that are sitting in your house using electricity and can we could reduce the amount of electrical utilization overall. Point of sale terminals. Every store has a cash register. They may have a point of sale terminal, but it's very expensive and almost always proprietary. We could create an open point of sale system at a much lower price and give the people systems administration to help them use it. So let's take a look at two of the vertical markets. The first one is apartments and condominiums. Not only can we give you regular desktop computing and access to the internet, but we can give you over the air digital TV as well as IP TV. We can also give you the ability to record and store your TV programs. You could listen to radio stations from around the world with IP radio. You can make inexpensive telephone calls or free telephone calls around the world using voice over IP. You can control the lights and the heat in your house automatically. You could have a security system that if somebody broke in, you could see who they are through the internet. 
It would be a place to store your pictures and your music. It would be your calendar, your alarm clock, and your wireless network. And you say, I know how to do all of this. I may even have it set up at my house to do this. But the thing is that your friends and neighbors don't know how to do this, and they don't want to know how to do this. They only want to be able to use it, and that would be your job. In large hotels, they have a lot of nice services. You may be able to access the internet from your hotel room. You may be able to order pizza from your hotel room. But the small posadas do not, cannot afford these services. They would love to be able to offer them. You could sell these services to the posadas and then manage these services for them. And the posadas could have just as good services as the large hotels. Let's talk a bit about our environment. Mr. Gore was here yesterday talking about the environment. Let me tell you something about it. Our computer systems use a lot of electricity. Our computer systems keep being thrown out every three or four years. We have no real good recycle or resale programs for them. And a lot of them still have bad chemicals inside of them. This is Itupu, the world's largest hydroelectric plant here in Brazil. It generates 14 billion watts of electricity every hour. But if your computer system is using 200 watts of electricity, as most desktops do, some desktops use 350 watts, and some of the ones back there in the back use about 1,000 watts of electricity. So we would have to build another 17 Itupus to give everybody in Brazil a desktop computer. Actually, we have to build eight of them to power the computers and eight of them to power the cooling systems for the computers. Instead, what we should be doing is cutting down on the amount of electrical utilization. We also need smaller footprints. This is a picture of a mountain of old computer cases. If we were to take the 1.25 billion computers and recycle them all at one time, it would be a mountain that would be larger than Mount Everest. We have to do things in a smarter way. And Project Kawa would have a complete recycling program to take the older systems, recycle them into newer systems to keep them out of landfills. So part of the Project Kawa solution is to create a thin client, a very powerful thin client, one that uses less than 10 watts of electrical power and it runs off of 12 volts. Why 12 volts? 12 volts is a universal voltage. It's the voltage that's in your car battery. It's the voltage that's in your, your uninterruptible power supply. So what we do now is we take 220 volts out of the wall. We take it down to 12 volts to charge our batteries. We bring it back up to 220 volts to put it into our computer. We take it down to 12 volts to make it work inside the computer. Up and down and up and down. This is very inefficient. Make it 12 volts, keep it 12 volts. With 12 volts and 10 watts, we no longer need to turn off our computer. How many of you, well, you're special because you're geeks. But how many of you turn off your computer to save electricity every once in a while? You know, when you turn off the computer, it's more useless than a boat anchor. I have a boat. I have a very heavy anchor. I throw it over. It holds my boat in place. I throw my computer system over, and my boat still drags along. 
So that's why a turned off computer is less useful than a boat anchor. But when you leave your computer on, it could be your security system, your telephone, your calendar, your alarm clock, all these other things. You should not ever turn your computer off. If you have only 10 watts, you can afford to do that. We want to make these things powered through the ethernet. So as long as they're connected to the network, they would have electricity to work with. We want to make them multifunction so they can run multiple programs at one time, all inside of the thin client. We want to have them use USB 3.0 to deliver five gigabits per second to devices. And use wireless, a uh, new wireless technology coming out called 60 gigahertz, which will deliver five gigabits per second wirelessly through the air. We want to build a cellular modem into it, so this could be your cellular phone receiver also. And we want to have no fan and no moving disk. Why is that important? Because the first thing that breaks in your computer is typically your fan or your disk. Your fan goes and your CPU burns up. Your disk goes, you have to take the CPU apart and replace it. You lose data. If you have no fan and no moving disk, then your system makes no sound and has a 10-year lifetime. That's what we want. We also want to design and build these thin clients here in Brazil. I'm talking with the University of Sao Paulo to design the thin client here in Brazil and have it manufactured in Brazil. How many of you know that computers here in Brazil are very expensive. Why is that? There is a 100% tax on any finished computers that come into Brazil. But there's only 6% tax on the parts of the computers that are coming in. And so if I bring in the parts like the CPU and the memory, but manufacture the computer here, I can almost cut the manufacturing cost in half. Plus, it gives jobs to Brazilians. Aren't you tired of giving jobs to people in Thailand? We are working with the university to do the design and the certification, and then they would license this to other manufacturers inside of Brazil at three to two to four reais per board to help pay for the design. It will have an open BIOS and open device drivers. There will be no closed technologies. And the design of this will itself be free and open so that anybody could actually build it if they wanted to. Now, you may only have one of these thin clients in your house, and you may have other wireless devices to access computers or you could have several of them, depending upon your needs. But like I said, it replaces many other control units which you would normally have in your household. It also saves desk on your de uh, space on your desktop in the office because it mounts on the back of an LCD panel. It's safer in hospitals because it doesn't have a fan that blows around germs. Germs love living inside of a nice warm PC. And just about the time that they get really hot, the fan comes on and blows the air all over and the germs all over. And as I said, we can support fat clients with file and print services with Project Kawa. The server systems will be three sizes, small, medium, and large. And the smallest one will work off of 12 volts. Why? So I could take these small servers and put them in places and power them with a water wheel or windmill or other things or a solar panel. The smallest server will actually be made up of two thin clients put together. So if one thin client fails, the other one will take over. And, this, and the data storage will be through USB 3.0. 
so you can use standard industry disks for it. The next two servers will be common servers from companies like IBM or Hewlett Packard or any other manufacturer. There's no hardware that has to be invented here. All of the hardware already exists. We will have add disk storage and memory as needed and we'll be able to expand the servers to meet the needs of the customers. Now, when most people in Brazil buy networking, they call up the telephone company or they call up the cable company and they say, I'd like to have networking. And the telephone company says, here's your telephone line for DSL. You can have three megabits a second. Great, wonderful. That's slow. What I intend to do is bring in high-speed networking to the server at 300 megabits a second, and then every thin client is connected to the server by a gigabit per second or 10 gigabit per second Ethernet. That way, if you're the only thin client accessing the Internet at that moment, you get the data at 300 megabits a second. If two people are accessing it, you get it at 150 megabits a second. If all 300 are accessing it, you get it at one megabit a second. But the odds of that happening are very small. So you will be getting better internet service all the time. And people say to me, Mad Dog, the telephone company and the cable company will not like this. Yes, they will. Because number one, they will lower their cost of sales because they'll be selling to only the entrepreneur. And number two, they won't have my mother and father calling them up complaining that their internet doesn't work. The only person that will call them will be the systems administrator entrepreneur. And they won't have to ask him whether his mouse is plugged in or whether he actually has his PC turned on because they'll be talking to a trained, certified, bonded, licensed individual. Now, the other thing about this is remember that each thin client is a wireless mesh repeater. The problem with wireless mesh is that you hop from mesh node to mesh node, you introduce latency into the mesh. What you need to have is a lot of backhauls so that as soon as you make maybe one hop, you're into the real wired ethernet that you now have control through quality of service techniques and routing techniques to be able to get that packet through the internet. Because each thin client is hardwired to the server and the server is hardwired to the internet, I create millions of backhauls with no additional antennas to be put up by the telephony companies or any of the wireless carriers. I've already started talking to the telephone companies about this and they are enthusiastic. But this also allows us to give away a little bit of our internet. If we give away one to two or three or four megabits a second, we don't mind because we're getting a gigabit a second to come up from the server. So I open up my wireless router. I don't have a password on it. I allow anybody to use it. It's working in a virtualized environment on a virtualized net. I say use it for free. But when I leave my house, I get to use your internet for free. You use mine for free, I use yours for free. I show you mine, you show me yours. <laughs> this has been working fine in places like the FON model. There's the Linus and the Bill. Bill charges for his internet, but has to pay for it when he goes other places. Linus gives away his internet, but gets it free when he goes other places. This also works in other places throughout the world. 
and this will help us provide the internet for the digital inclusion because now wherever you go inside of the urban environment you'll be able to open up your internet device and connect to the internet automatically. You won't have to type in a password. You won't have to check a little box that says you agree to terms of service. You just open it up and you will be able to use it. This is the way that God intended the internet to be used. Each thin client will also have 60 gigahertz wireless internet, which will give you seven gigabit per second transfer. So you won't have to have wires going to your high definition TV or going to your audio system because seven gigabits per second will transfer anything you want to move. And we're going to be adding additional functionality to the system over time by using USB 3.0 dongles. Everything on the server and in the thin client is going to be working inside of a virtualized layer. So if I start a program going on my thin client and I say it's too slow, I need it to go faster, I migrate that virtual environment down to the server. The server then starts running that virtual environment and displaying back on my thin client. If it's still too slow, then I take and I move it out to the cloud. And I can move this virtualized environment any place I want it because I'm using standards in the virtualized place. All of the data will be encrypted so people will have their privacy secure. Mom and pop don't know how to encrypt data. They don't know how to set up an encrypted file system. That's where you come in. You will help them do this. We're going to have flexible resources to be able to move around these programs. And we're going to allow you to store your data any place you want to store it whether it be on a thumb drive connected to your thin client, the local server system in the basement of your building, or out on the cloud. So how many thin clients and servers are we talking about? Well, in Brazil, there's 192 million Brazilians. And 80% of them live in an urban environment. So that's 154 million. Now, you might want to have one of these thin clients at your home, attached to your LCD panel. Then you might want to have another one for you at school or at work. So you could probably double that number. And then there's about 92 million point of sale terminals in Brazil. So if you add all of that up, it's about 400 million thin clients. A good rule of thumb is about 300 thin clients per server system. And we feel this is a good number of thin clients for an administrator to handle as a business. And if that's the case, we need 1.3 million high, available, high availability servers, which will be made up of about 2.6 million CPUs. This will also need about 1.3 million system administrator entrepreneurs. That's a lot of people. And the reason we need this is because over time, we keep moving the support further and further away from the end user. When I started in computers, if you worked on a computer, you had a master's degree in computer science or you had a doctorate in computer science. And if you couldn't figure something out, you turned to the person next to you who also had a master's degree in computer science or a PhD. Today, if you need help with your computer, you pick up the phone and you dial a number. And you get a voice that says, thank you for calling the service line. Please press button number one for service. Button number two for English. Boop. 
But number 47 for Portuguese. Boop. <laughs> and then what you do is you wait. And what you hear is Muzak. <laughs> and after 20 minutes, you get disconnected. This is not the type of service that we need. But with Project Kawa, you go down in your building and you find the systems administrator in your building and their job is to help you fix your problem. This is what people want. And this is what people will pay you for. So how do you get trained, trained for this? As I said, it's a big job. We're going to have to train about 10,000 of these people every month for 200 months, almost 10 years, in order to meet the optimum demand. And so we're going to have to invent training that goes over DVDs and the internet for free. And we're going to use, allow people to use virtualized systems to set up virtualized networks on their own computer to be able to practice doing their work. And then we can use older systems set aside to do real hands-on live training. We're going to do specialized training for specialized tasks. We don't expect that every single one of you will have to be trained in how to do installation of the initial hardware, how to pull a cable. You don't have to be trained to do that you can hire somebody to do that. But you will have to be certified and licensed by the government. And we can provide that at low cost also. So how much will a Project Cower system cost? We believe that we can make the thin client for less than 200 US dollars, way less. So it'd be about 400 reais here in Brazil. And this would be a multi-core, virtualized, hyper-threaded processor, which would have 3D video in it and hardware decompression, so you could have full screen HDTV. It'd have two gigabytes of memory and many USB 3.0 ports, along with your 60 gigahertz Wi-Fi and ha either have a gigabit or 10 gigabit per second ethernet with power over the ethernet and wake on LAN. These things would be sellable and reusable, so if your small server system needed to be expanded, you'd be able to sell that to somebody else and they'd be able to use it. You would also be paying for this over a three year loan so the amount of money you spend every month is very small. Now I talked to somebody from Telefonica while I was here at Campus Party. And they said, we can't put cable to every house because it will cost $1,500 to put the cable in a house. I said, what is the cost? And they said, the cost is actually stringing the cable. The cable itself no cost whatsoever, really. It's the work that it takes to string the cable. I said, okay, string 10 cables at one time. Turn on one of them. Charge me $1,500, but I'm gonna be paying this back over 10 years. That's $150 a year, or about $13 a month. What do I care? Because I'm getting a couple gigabits a second of internet. The problem that Telefonica has is that they don't know how to raise the money to do this in order to do it for everybody. But if everybody just paid them $1,500, they'd have the money to do it. So we are going to raise that money for them and everybody can have really high-speed networking in their homes. What we're paying for here is high-quality, long-life equipment and networking 
that will allow you to have the type of networking power and computing power you need far into the future. We're doing value, not cost. But the thing is that the longer you do this and the faster you do this, the more the cost drops over time. Other costs we're going to have, we'll have to provide you with an LCD panel. And of course we would have it LED backlit because of saving on mercury, getting rid of mercury. And there'll be various security and home automation controls that you need for your house. But all of this is paid for on a monthly basis and a very small amount of money so people can afford it. What about the people who have virtually no money? Remember our wireless bubble. We can create very cheap Wi-Fi based devices to, hook, to give them so they can access the internet like the cloud. And then we can provide them with services back on the servers that they can have access to store their data and be able to get the training and information they need to get jobs. Now, over time and due to volume, two things are going to happen. Some people will say, I want to replace my thin client with a better one, even though it's perfectly good. And they'll be able to sell that thin client to somebody else who needs it, but doesn't have a lot of money. But also over time, as you know, manufacturing costs are going to drop. And so if we start providing these services to people who have the money to pay for them now, as time goes on, we'll be able to offer them to more and more people who don't have as much money. The concept is to increase the amount of money in the community so that everybody can afford this. To give jobs to people who don't have jobs now so that they can afford to have this. So how does a systems administrator get the money to buy these equipment? They get loans either from private banks or from friends and family. They say to your friends and family, loan me the money to start my business and I will pay you back with interest. We're going to go to large banks and get an underwriting program started. So in case any particular loan is not paid back, the bank will be able to get its money back from the underwriting program. So how much will the systems administrator entrepreneur make? Typically about $1,800 to $2,000 a month to start. That's with 300 thin clients as their customers. They'll get about $6 per thin client per month for their salary. But then as they teach additional classes, as they do additional services, they get more money than that. And this is how you build your own business. Because you are an entrepreneur, you're basically leasing the hardware and these services to your customers and you maintain the system over time to give them better service and better capabilities. And that's why they keep you on. How hard will this job be? These are gonna be very fixed configurations in a, in a Linux terminal server project uh, configuration. Today, there are Linux terminal server configurations of, of 5,000 thin clients with 46 servers, with 22,000 end users being maintained by one systems administrator. So with Project Kawa, I'm talking about two servers, 300 thin clients, and 300 customers. You're gonna have time to put your feet up on your desk. You're gonna have time to learn to play the guitar. <laughs> You're gonna have time to learn how to do better web programming or write compilers will do all sorts of other things or make even more money.
You have lots of open source tools that will help you do this job. And you can automate a lot of the job over time. We're also going to provide other second level and third level support for you. So of course you'll have other entrepreneurs in forums that you can ask questions of and you can share ideas. And if people come up with new ways of making money, you can share that idea so that everybody can make more money. And you can leverage off of SourceForge with the 230,000 applications out there that would work with Project Kawa. So, to become a Kawa entrepreneur, learn about free software systems administration, start studying it now, learn how to set up your file systems, learn about virtualization, learn about networking. We will be publishing Kawa specific information on the website, free of charge, learn that, and then at a certain time when the project is ready, You'll get certified, licensed, and bonded. You'll go out to find your customers. You'll get what is known as a letter of intent from them that says that they will be your customer if you provide these services. You take that to a bank, they give you the money. You buy the equipment and install it. And then you start delivering your services to your customers and start collecting your money. It doesn't sound hard, does it? It isn't. And you'll find out that the harder you work, the more money you'll make, which is why I'm a capitalist. The implementation of Project Cow is going to be completely open. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, so we're going to be using all of the free software that exists already, and we're going to be asking people to help us out. But everything we do will be published back on the website. There will, be not any, there will be no hidden mailing lists. All of our money that we get will be published. Anybody that makes a salary, you'll know who they are. And the software will be owned by the community. And it will be funded by sponsorships. We are looking for that sponsorship funding right now. I am talking to various companies throughout Brazil and in other places. Once we get the funding, we will announce what the first vertical markets are that we're going to attack. We will go out to the community to ask you to help us find out what people want in those vertical markets. We will generate surveys for you to help us fill them out. And then once we have that information, we will then say, okay, these are the things that the customers want. What is the free software that could deliver this functionality to the customer? We will create pilots that we will start here in Brazil. We will run the pilots for six months, and then we will publish the results of those pilots. We will tell you what went right, what went wrong, We'll publish manuals on how you to set up the software and run it. We'll publish spreadsheets that will say, plug in how much money you want to make, and you'll find out how many clients you need. And then once we finish the, po the pilots here in Brazil, we'll start pilots in the Spanish-speaking parts of Latin America, perhaps Argentina, or Uruguay, or Chile or Peru. And we hope that next year we start offering courses on entrepreneurship and we certify our first entrepreneurs. We have a board of directors. Everybody on this board is Brazilian except for three people. Daniel Coletti in the upper corner is from Argentina. He is running a educational association. Myself, I come from the United States, and a person named Jody Newman is also from the United States, but he deals in international law and international telephony, and so it's worthwhile having him on. I will also mention Dr. Marcelo Zufo, who is from the University of Sao Paulo. He is the person who will be helping us design our Think Clients. 
We have a technical board which will grow over time. One person I will mention on here is Bedale Garby from Hewlett Packard, who was the head of the, at one time of the Debian Association. And of course, Pablo, who introduced me, who is also with Debian. So to find out more about Project Kawa, you can go to the website. Under downloads, we have some of the documentation about what the project is and how we're actually going to do it. And I will mention this one quote from Edwin Land, who started the Polaroid Land Company for Polaroid cameras. He said, do not undertake a project unless it is manifestly important and nearly impossible. That is Project Kawa. It is manifestly important, and it may be nearly impossible, but we're willing to take it on. With that, I'll try and answer any questions. I would like to thank the Linux Mall for my two little friends. And I actually have a friend to toss out to the crowd to be an entrepreneur. Ready? One, two, three. All right, there we go. Thank you. Now I don't have the, the headset, oh, I do have the headset. And if you have a question, we ask that you use the microphone so that the translators can hear it and that I can, and I have 10 minutes I've been told I can answer questions and, uh, and also so that the streaming video can hear it also. Se alguém tiver perguntas, por favor, levanta a mão para levar o microfone, ok? Quem vão ser os fabricantes dos Team Clients? There are about 800 uh, small manufacturers here in Brazil. They all have surface mount technology uh, lines and they are capable of manufacturing the thin clients. The thin clients do not have to be very, very small because they, they need to be able to dissipate the heat without using a fan. And they're going to be mounted on the back of an LCD panel so they can be relatively large. So your heat can be dissipated throughout the entire cabinet of the thin client. And in addition, it gives you edge area to have multiple USB 3.0 ports all around the side. So that you can then more easily plug in your USB 3.0 dongles. So size is not a consideration. Because the board can be large, it means that the printed circuit board doesn't have to have as many layers. And therefore, it's easier to manufacture. Um, so we believe that a lot of these uh, systems can be manufactured here inside of Brazil by relatively small companies who can afford to manufacture them, but they can't afford to do the design. And they can't afford to take the risk that once they've done the design and manufactured the system, that nobody would buy them. So whenever you try and get something, somebody to do something, you do one of two things. You either make it very profitable or you make it very easy. And we want to make it both. Mr. Madog. Hey. Shit. Antes. Wait, 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 wait. Antes de mais nada, eu gostaria de agradecer o seu trabalho e dizer que sou um grande fã. Eu venho trabalhando desde 2003 com é, Thin Clients, utilizando LTSP, totalmente é, sistemas open source, sem sistema operacional tá? é, em, é, embarcado. 
E eu tenho tentado, com vários fornecedores ao longo desses anos, diminuir o preço, tanto dos thin clients, quanto da infraestrutura para utilizá-los. Tá? Uh, no projeto Cauã, eu gostaria de saber, efetivamente, como nós podemos baixar os, pre os preços do thin client, da infraestrutura que é necessária para utilizá-los e como administradores de sistemas podem se inscrever para trabalhar no projeto junto com o senhor. Well, first of all, when you look at, you know, when you change the the, the model from selling thin clients and selling servers into selling a service to somebody so that they can pay for it a little bit each month and you you make it so that they can buy the hardware over a long period of time through the use of a loan that is paid back then actually the price of the hardware is not the the problem the price of the hardware is the smallest amount of the problem what people are really paying for what is really going to cost the money is the connection to the internet, the media and the services that they're purchasing, the cost of the hardware actually shrinks to insignificance. So let's say that the thin client ends up costing 200 reais. We're talking about a thing which is going to have a 10 year lifetime. That's about 20 reais a year. That's insignificant. And even if you add 100% on top of that for financing fee, it's still insignificant. So you have to put together the entire picture. Now the second thing is whenever somebody goes into manufacture, there's a lot of reasons why they charge a lot for a thin client. First of all, they have to pay off their design costs. And even if they haven't spent much on the design, they have certification, they have return issues, and all of these things they have to take into account, which raises the price of the hardware. This thin client is not going to have even a power supply on it. It's not going to have a time of year clock battery because it's going to get the time from the internet. This thing will have nothing on it that's actually going to burn out or wear out other than the actual circuitry itself. And I don't know about you, but I've had many TV sets in my life that have lasted for longer than 10 years. I've had many radios in my life that have lasted longer than 10 years. Because when something is solid state with no moving parts, it can last a very, very long time. So I think the problem here is not the price of the thin client. The issue is giving enough, uh, enough computation power so that the person is satisfied with a thin client and the server for a long period of time. And then you pay for that over time by taking out fi proper financing through a bank. Oh, and, and how to sign up for Project Kawa. Right now, just go to the site. You can log in. You can you know, create a login for yourself. Please use your real email address. I promise you I'm not going to spam you or something. And you can always you know, get off of the site if you don't like it. But we're serious about this. And we would really like to know who you are and have you help us in defining what Project Kawa is going to be. Over time, we will set up more mailing lists and forums and things like that as the project moves forward. So, you know, right now, just go to the site, read the documentation, which is under the download section, and start to become familiar with what Project Kawa would be. Okay, next question, please. Okay. Muito obrigado pela sua presença de novo no Brasil, nós agradecemos. É, eu tenho acompanhado o projeto Culo a, a, desde o início e ao longo desse tempo outras demandas e outras tendências têm surgido. Como é que tipo de apelo esse tipo de device vai ter diante da onda 
e da tendência que tem havido em torno dos tablets? I, I think that tablets are a wonderful thing, and you know I, I love it when everybody kind of waves their hand and says that everything is going to be going wireless. But in New York City, there's a problem. You can no longer make a telephone call using a 3G phone because all of the bandwidth is being used by people downloading pornography. Now. You know, I mean, you have to go back to two, two and a half G or Edge in order to make a telephone call because all of the 3G is people watching pornography on their phone. And this is a law, which I call Hall's Law, which says that no matter how much wireless bandwidth you give somebody, they are going to use more than you could possibly give. So when you're using wireless technology, the way you solve the problem is you keep making your wireless cells smaller and smaller. And you use less and less power in each one of those cells, and your bandwidth is there. So what AT&T had to do was they had to put up lots more antennas to make their cells smaller so that the same bandwidth can satisfy a fewer number of people inside of each cell. That's like what happened last year at Campus Party. They had lots and lots and lots of wireless here. They had more wireless than anybody ever dreamed of. And you guys sucked it all up in about 10 minutes because you were watching all that porn. Now, I know what you were doing. You were actually <laughs> downloading new copies of Linux and porn. <laughs> so with, with, with Kawa, because every single uh, node is a wireless mesh repeater hooked to a wired backhaul, we can adjust the power on those wireless mesh repeaters so that we're not overlapping with the other wireless mesh repeaters. This allows us to effectively create, increase the bandwidth capability and make Pico cells incredibly small cells. This is already being done in the United States with something called a femtocell. It's a thing that allows your cellular telephone to connect to a unit in your house, which then captures your cellular telephone call and sends it through the internet to the telephone company. It's a Pico cell. The problem is that there's not very many of them, they're expensive, and the telephone company can't afford to put up that many more towers. So we have to do something, because wireless, unless there's a miracle that happens, will be used up. And what will happen, what'll have to happen is the government will have to take away bandwidth from other uses. And that's very difficult to do. So Project Cow is a solution which allows you to use your tablet. It allows you to use your wireless Wi-Fi phone at much higher speeds because you have these Pico cells created. Any other questions? Last question, I'm told. Uh, John Mandog. É, prazer, eu estou trabalhando com um projeto parecido com o seu, já faz uns sete anos por conta. É, eu tava, uma das perguntas é, por que não usar aquela placa chamada BeagleBoard, que é um projeto aberto, que utiliza processador ARM, que gasta 2 watts. E outra coisa, o TeamClite, como eu trabalho também com LTSP, é, não deixar ele um terminal tão burro ou terminal fino, terminal magro. É, deixar ele um pouquinho mais inteligente e processar alguma coisa, não deixar toda a parte para o servidor. I am the person who gave Linus Torvalds his first alpha system to be able to create a 64-bit version 
of Linux. That was in 1995, 16 years ago. Today, when I use 64-bit Linux on my notebook, I still find libraries that don't work. I find, you know, X servers that fail. I find device drivers that don't work. Why? Because in reality, the Intel instruction set has won. Maybe it'll be from Intel, maybe it's from AMD, I don't care what it is, but the instruction set has won. Now ARM, inside of a notebook, that the only thing that it's using is a web browser, or inside of a phone with very specialized applications, that's wonderful. But if I wanted to get a real assortment of applications, typically the architecture that they're built and compiled and assembled and packaged for is Intel. And I want to be able to move my application from system to system easily using virtualization. But if all of a sudden I move my Intel instruction onto an ARM processor, I not only have to do virtualization, but I have to do hardware emulation. And that's extremely difficult. So while I encourage people to use the, Atom Pro the ARM processor in things like tablets where you want to use a web browser, for the people that want to have applications that they can easily move back and forth, I think it's better to use an Intel instruction set. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be around afterwards, but we have to get off the stage so that other people can use it. Thank you. Então, eu quero agradecer ao Medog de novo por estar aqui no Brasil e de novo por nos trazer essas informações importantes. Ele está circulando sempre aí na, no evento, ele está circulando ali na área de software livre também. Então, se quiserem conversar com ele, ele está por aí. E, então, mais uma vez, obrigado, Medog. Thank you, Medog.